So we've just moved from uh, the heck cattle over there and we've now met a few more friends on the farm. This is a tame one. Hello. Right Nessa, so I'm going to introduce you to a very tame wild boar. <laughs> this one's an old one, it's 12 years yeah. old. When I say it's a wild boar, it's actually a, a Tamworth cross boar, but you can see it's quite dark and hairy. Mm. So it looks more like a boar than a pig. And he's a lovely animal, very steady, very tame. What that bull is there to do is to mate with the cows, eat grass, and then spend a lot of its life sleeping, okay? That's what bulls like to do. So if you ask your mum about your dad, your mum will probably tell you that given half a chance, he'd like to behave in the same sort of way. Um, this is the first beaver I've, I've seen. It's, it's very exciting. Um, they are incredible animals. We are going to have to go and rescue our truck now before those, ba those buffaloes start to rub their horns up and down. So I'm here on a lovely July day, um, first one in a while, and I'm here at Upcoat Farm with Derek Gow, who is the man um, helping us do our beaver release over at Mapperton. And we're just here on his farm, is that, is that right. what we yeah. call it? Yep. Um, in order to look at some of the amazing species he has here for introduction around the world. Um, and the first of which is just behind us here. These are a breed of cattle, they're called Heck cattle, mm. and they were made by two brothers, Heinz and Lutz Heck, between the First and Second World War, and they wanted to be able to go back into their forests and hunt these animals, yeah. and they also wanted to show that through this selective breeding, they, they could establish mm. animals again that were extinct. And so why are they here? Why are what they, are they here? doing over here? Well, that's a jolly that's, good question, yes. Nesta, and you know, there are times <laughs> when I ask myself that same question, because an organisation called the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust mm wanted to have these animals for a project at Slimbridge at the centre there um, approximately 15 years ago and there were none of them in Britain and they asked me to import them from Belgium and from Holland and I did mm -hmm. that and then halfway through the quarantine period which follows import they came down to look at them, realised how difficult they were going to be oh and decided they didn't want them at all. <laughs> so I've had them here on my farm for, for about 15 years, right. um, simply because there wasn't anywhere yeah, else for yeah, them yeah. to go. So we've just moved from uh, the heck cattle over there and we've now met a few more friends on the farm. Um, <laughs> can you tell me what these these cows over here are? Okay, so these, these are, are Asiatic water buffalo. Mm. You can tell by their horn shape, they're probably a, a Romanian breed. And though water buffalo were used in Britain in the past, and it is very likely that there were feral herds of water buffalo in places like Devon and Cornwall in the 12th and 13th century, those were not animals that had been here since the last ice age. Yeah. They were animals that would have been brought here by people, you know, as draft animals to plough, whatever else, ploughing wetlands maybe, mm -hmm. and then they would have run feral and established themselves for a time. But the point of these, as far as we're concerned, is that when again we're starting to talk about changing landscapes, something like this as a field is beginning to become unflat mm. and raggedy, and you can see digging yeah, yeah, and pits yeah. and everything else, which of course the boar over there are providing. But we don't have a big animal in our complement of wild animals that you can turn out into something like this and it's going to take its hooves and its mm. horns and start to dig down into the ground like a gigantic mole to make more ponds. And so how does managing these cattle compare to the heck cattle? They, these are no problem. I mean, these literally, if you come out with a bucket of feed and you just go around a quad bike and rattle at the fall, you're right back down mm. at the farm. No problem, right. none at all. What we're going to do is some animals like this that are very big, because this is still a relatively small farm, it's about 150 mm -hmm. acres in this area, is that these guys will be here for maybe six months or a year. And then what we're going to do is we're going to talk to other people like you and say, Nestor, would you like to borrow the water buffalo for your farm? So you can then have yeah, something yeah. that's wallowing and creating ponds on your estate. We do the TB test. You agree that you're going to feed them yeah. through the next winter. And then we speak to the next person. So for those of us who are going to do this, where we can, we try and work together. Mm. Um, and it'll make, we'll, we'll achieve a lot more, a lot more quickly if we do that. Yeah rather than if we just try to do everything on our own. I see. Right, Nessa, so I'm going to introduce you to a very tame wild boar. 
This one's an old one, it's 12 years yeah. old. When I say it's a wild boar, it's actually a, a Tamworth cross boar, but you can see it's quite dark and hairy, so it looks more like a boar than a pig. And he's a lovely animal, very steady, very tame. Yeah, oh. and, um, and so even when he was younger, was he also this tame? Yeah, he's always or been really been? great. He's always <laughs> been very, very used to people and very quiet, and very right. calm. When they open up these banks and they have wallows, you get a lot of mud. You get things like house martens coming down yeah. to use the mud for the nest. You get things like potter wasps using the disturbed mud um, for their nest. I've heard that they're able to root up to 60 acres a year. Um, however, here it doesn't look like that's quite happened. Um, why, why is it so different <laughs> here then? I was really worried about that because Charlie Burrell's been here. He's looked at it, he told me the same and we're looking at 150 acres. So if you look at that and think, yeah. <laughs> that's one boar, two boar maximum. And in here, there are five adults and 14 piglets. We are on the west coast. It rains here. We have a lot of established right. pasture and the grass grows well. Those five boar in this, yes, they can turn a lot of it over mm. in the winter time, but it all recovers really quickly right, right. by the time you get to late spring or early summer. And we are going to have to go and rescue our truck now before those, bu those buffaloes start to rub their horns up and down. If you are enjoying this episode, please consider supporting this important part of England's heritage by becoming a patron at mappertonlive.com. Do you breed the beavers here or are they imported from elsewhere or how does it work? Well, we do breed some beavers here, but not enough to supply many projects. So out on the farm there are big enclosures and there are baby beavers in the enclosures but the beavers that come to mapperton will come from the tay they will mm -hmm. come under license from scottish natural heritage they will be beavers that were otherwise shot if they didn't come to you right all right there's yeah. a beaver <laughs> um and is this one an adult yet that's or an adult that's yeah that's adult, that's right. a big one i mean there's there's you know, baby beavers are about that size mm. and they're like corks, okay? So if you had a baby beaver floating there, it'd be floating there in the same way that the apple's floating, be light, buoyant, right. um, you know, very up in the water, whereas these things when they're, they're big get yeah. really heavy. All you can yeah. see is their head and they're like kind of like big furry hippos. Um, this is the first beaver I've, I've seen. It's, it's very exciting. They are incredible animals. 40 kilos is about 40. a really big one. Oh, right. Normally it's kind of like 18 to 22 kilos. Right. But for a rodent, that's still a big rodent. That's yeah. as heavy as like a, a Labrador mm. or a Rodia. So, you yeah. know, it's a big, big <laughs> rodent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just incredible. Um, I was so excited to be walking through maps and just <laughs> perhaps see some chippings from a tree or a tree that's just been completely knocked over, or not, well, chopped down. Yeah. And, uh, There's links in here and they're going to be in a very small pen, pen. shut away for the night because yeah. this is a sheep farming country and we don't want any anybody going over the fence in the evening. Yeah, yeah. Wow. They are incredible. So these would take down a small rope? They'd take or... down, they'd take down roebuck. But they're forest animals and if you have, you know, big areas of forest like Kielder, west coast of Scotland, but you know, maybe increasingly the lands that we know as we, we, we start to plant more trees and we allow more scrub mm. to regenerate, that's the environment where plenty of sheep, plenty of leg and yeah. like rabbits and hares, these guys are going to occupy and hunt. And that's a hooting lynx. So it's hooting because it's a female and the guy guaranteed us it was three females. What do you see hanging off the back of those two in front of you? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So Nestor, there's a good zoo story for you. Is, Always check is, the gonads. Yeah, never accept anything that comes in a closed box. Right, so we've just walked down through some amazingly wild woodlands um, and we found a bit of a clearing and I've just been told that that is all the work of the beavers. So you can see uh, down behind me here and um, we're just discussing the impact on the environment here. Um, so, so if you could tell us a bit more about it. Well, the impact on the environment is of course, one, it's sunny, but two, hey, it's very wet. And one of us <laughs> fell into it. And, um, but the point of this is that this is a beaver dam here. We'll go around the other side and have a look at the height of it in a minute. Mm. But what the beavers have been doing in the sunny areas is they have been sculpting the trees. So 
That tree there is a multi-stemmed willow, so they've been able to go in with their, their heads, and because they bite with two incisors on the top jaw, two incisors on the bottom jaw, they make these kind of scallop shapes, like mm. an ice cream scoop yeah, yeah. going through ice cream. I and see. in the end, this all comes down. But with these multi-stemmed willow, what's very interesting is that the ones in the middle are they're surrounded by such complexity of other difficult <laughs> bits that the beavers can't get in to fell the yeah, one in yeah, the middle. Yeah. And when you see those ones there, those ones with the bramble round mm. them, have just meant it's impossible for the beaver to do anything about them. I see. So it's in the initial, while in the initial stages when a beaver goes into the woodland, it's very easy to mm. get the trees you want to fell them. Yeah. When the vegetation changes and you have thorn mantling the bottom of the trees, then you're forced out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a kind of like game of cat and mouse with the trees. <laughs> Basically, these were the old Victorian drainage ditches and what I the see. beavers have done by blocking it is they put the water back off to one side mm -hmm. when you have a lot of rain these that forms other streams and the further you go down the valley the more and more dams yeah, there yeah. are and so how big was this sort of stream here originally i'll show you come and have a look right. it's around the corner here so this is the original stream nester don't fall yeah. backwards into it <laughs> yeah. but in the summertime, these things in Devon are called Devon gutters. Mm. And what happens is that in the winter time, when you've heavy rainfall on the land, they rage. Right. So you have a wall of water scouring down until it hits the first obstacle, which at the bottom of this, about two and a half miles away from here, is a bridge above the village. And then it comes right across the road and it floods the road. Yeah. And then as soon as the water stops raining, there is no water at all. So all you, if you were here before the beaver started, you would just have bedrock and nothing. Yeah. And now, yeah. you know, even when we look down here, can you see all the water boatmen? Yeah, I can. Yeah. In, in the water, there are fish here, there are tadpoles here, there are coot, there are moorhen, there are grey wagtails. Because yeah. what the beavers have done is they have turned this back into seas of ponds and mm. impoundments. So there is water, huge amount of water here that would never have been yeah. here before. So we had a look at a lot of the landscapes in Mapperton mm -hmm. and we think that overall your river corridor is entirely suitable. But there's one particular area which is a big kind of, it's almost like the bottom of a boat. You know, it kind of like, yeah. it's not sharp. It curves in from the sides. It's got this kind of like big bowl yeah, in yeah. the bottom. It's maybe about half a mile, a third of a mile long. There's a lot of willow. The stream weaves and winds through it. And there's huge, and you can see underneath the trees there, the beginnings of the vegetation like greater tussock sedge and flag mm. iris and all the aquatic plants are there. So that when the beavers go in there and they start to fell the trees and they open the hole to sunlight, that what will happen is that you'll have the most amazing warm marsh follow, um, developing. It will have grass snakes in it, yeah. coot, moorhen, little grebes. Yeah. Kingfishers, all manner of other life will, will coagulate there, especially as the amphibians and the insects start to reform. Mm. And we think that is the very best place for the beavers at Mapperton. Yeah. Other than this area just being an amazing place to just come here and, and, just, and just watch wildlife, is there any other reason why you've converted this farm into this just amazing landscape? Well, Nestor, the thing is, at your age in life, you never appreciate lives are very short. And what I found increasingly was that I never had any time to come down into here when I was farming because I was just too busy. I'd be sorting sheep's feet or there would always be a better thing to do. And then on the odd occasion you came down and you saw the damselflies and the, the small coppers and the common blues and all the things that there just weren't in the farmland, it was the bit that you really enjoyed in your week or your month or whatever else. It's the bit you can still remember. And you began to realise that really, in a landscape where everybody else is farming, and where the only thing that keeps the farming going are the state subsidies anyway, why am I doing exactly the same as everybody else to produce a landscape that is largely dead? I mean, just coming here gets me so excited for the next stage of, of rewilding at Mapton. So um, thank you so much for giving me my uh, first sight of what it might be like. <laughs>